And welcome to the Friday edition of Grassroots Radio Colorado. This is Chris Cook. And before we dive into to tonight's program, I want to tell you what tonight is not going to be about. <laughs> we are not going to discuss the Cromnibus, okay? I am not going to discuss that spending bill. I've spent the entire day on it. I'm sure you have hopefully gotten sick of it by now and uh, are not looking forward to an in-depth analysis of how we've been betrayed. We will go into that on Monday. And so you're definitely going to want to listen when I have Tom Tancredo in studio on Monday. Uh, we will we will talk about that. We will talk about the betrayal and uh, we will talk about what we do next. So so definitely tune in then. But tonight I've got Corey and Andy Pate of the Party of Choice. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Hello. I'm so glad that you're here. And so we have a little different program planned for this evening. And this isn't your usual night. It won't be the usual program. Exactly. <laughs> we figured, let's just change it all up. Exactly. <laughs> so what are we going to talk about tonight? Well, we thought we would talk about being Christian in a party of many beliefs. Okay. And the reason that we kind of thought this might be timely is because I just happened to see a comment on Facebook. It was in a pretty heated discussion. And... It was by a non-Christian conservative who was saying that she and other non-Christian conservatives and Republicans felt like they had to pass a litmus test that was being administered by Christians in the GOP. Okay. And that they didn't feel like they were really being accepted for who they were unless they passed this test. Right. Because we have a faith test in the right. Republican Party at some times. And some, some folks do. I mean, some folks, if you're, if you're not a Christian, you're obviously not a conservative. Oh, yes. And I have met people like that. Um, I remember even as a kid, um, I was raised by very conservative Christian parents, and we went to a conservative Christian church. And there were some people, well-meaning people, but still, they believed that it was our Christian duty to pass laws to make people act more Christian. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> we get into that all the time. <laughs> we, we got into it with the Amendment 64 debate. Yes. With the marijuana debate, big time. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so, yeah, we see this a lot. So so how do how do we address this? How do we how do we approach this subject? Well, I want to look at three things tonight. And uh, first of all, I just want to tell uh, all the because uh, people know that I'm, you know, a born again, right wing, evangelical Christian wacko nut. Okay. That's pretty we know you're a nut. Okay. Okay, okay. We already know you're a nut. The other stuff I like to, you know, just put on a T-shirt. The, but I want everybody to know who is not a Christian out there, I don't blame you for sometimes feeling awkward or maybe even embarrassed to be politically tied to people like me. Okay. I worship a 2,100-year-old martyr. Right. All right. And I, can say, and I can see on the face of that, that can seem pretty crazy. That can seem pretty wild, and it it seems really intimidating to feel that I and people like me are trying to use the Republican Party as our vehicle to evangelize, our vehicle to to enforce our views. And I can understand why that can feel awkward, and I want to deal with that tonight. And I want to do it in three ways. First of all, I want to uh, talk about some of the reasons I'm a Christian. And how many hours could I go on about Proofs of the faith. Honey. You could have a week's worth of shows easily. Absolutely. Yes. It's, it's, <laughs> okay. kind, it's kind of what I do. I could go We on. have three sister stations here. That can... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is kind of what I do. And I, I could go on for hours and hours and hours talking about proofs of the faith. As people probably know, I was raised as an, as an atheist and a Marxist. And so I went through a very um, intellectual conversion, which became very emotional at the end. Well, I want to talk tonight and give just just a couple few reasons about why Christianity makes sense, not for evangelism, but actually to comfort non-Christian uh, conservatives just enough to so you'll know you're not, you know, politically bonded to a bunch of kooks. Right. We're okay. Okay. We actually think we 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 <laughs> we, we, we um we actually believe in this twenty one hundred year old martyr and stuff like that for a reason. Second thing, the second thing I really want to go into is why I love. Atheist conservatives, and I do. And I not, love not just for dinner. Not just for dinner. No, <laughs> no, absolutely not. And I don't just take them to my private island to hunt for sport. I mean, I actually, I actually love them. I think they're awesome. I'm proud to be in the same party with them. I've got lots of friends who are, and it's great. Okay. Okay. And the last thing then is in the last section why Christmas is so important to us because it's at this time of year when these debates break out the most. That's true. And I won't even be mentioning the birth of Christ for much. Not really. Okay. 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 Sounds like a plan. 
All right. All right. Want me to dive in? Dive in. Okay. Like I said, there's endless ones. At no point am I going to prove God is actually here, for sure. But I'm going to uh, show some reasons why we believe he is. The first thing is a thing called progressive creativity. Does that sound boring enough? <laughs> the, it sounds like a social science. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Okay, here's what progressive... First of all, you know that there is there is plenty of creativity out in the animal kingdom. Okay, beavers create dams and ants create anthills, and they adapt to various water flows and, and terrain in doing so. Humans have a different thing. We have creativity as well, but we have a thing called progressive creativity. That is the desire and ability of a species to progress with its use of creativity from generation to generation to generation. We build bigger, better, bigger, better, bigger, better things, little or better, little or better, little or better things. Uh, beavers are creating the same dams they've created for thousands of years. And here's the key. They have no desire or ability to progress and make better ones. Okay. If you take uh, chimpanzees out of the uh, out of the lab, you know where they're not prompted by us and interested by us and various things, and leave them un never never bothered by humans out in the wild, they don't progress. They have no desire to. Okay, th th that is a uniquely human thing. And so my question, especially as a young atheist, was where did this come from? Okay. It makes us completely separate from the entire animal kingdom. We're, we're the only ones progressing. Right. We're the only ones who want to and apparently who can. My, my first, so what do you think my first reason that I gave was? It's pretty obvious. Higher intelligence. That would be my first thought. <clears throat> yeah, that we have bigger the first brain. thought running through my head. Exactly. We have bigger brains, okay? And so we're, we're a lot smarter. And so with higher intelligence came progressive creativity. Big problem with that. It doesn't work at all with the evidence. Uh, imagine if you could line up the animal kingdom. You know, at the lowest end, you know, from the lowest intelligence all the way to the top. Okay, so you start with the single-celled creatures. Right. You know, you move up through earthworms and then, you know, whatever, right? Fish and then, you know, um, bears, chimpanzees. The guys who hang out in country bars. Con country bars. <laughs> guys who hang out in country bars. Uh, finally, you get to uh, human beings and then at the very top above them, my wife. Okay, you know, <laughs> well played. Exactly, exactly. This is how guys do this on the air, and you will never get divorced. It's fantastic. Okay, so here's the thing. So you have looking at the animal kingdom, starting at the bottom in intelligence, it's more, 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 more us. Right. Okay, all the way up to us. Now look at the same ladder with progressive creativity, and you see none. None, 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 all. There's no progress. At no point is progressive creativity linked to intelligence. Having greater intelligence doesn't bring greater progressive creativity anywhere in the animal kingdom all the way up to us. It only starts with us. And so the question is, what are the odds that it would only start with us and nowhere else? And the answer is simple. Count how many species there have been, millions, and it's that many to one, millions to one. We are very unique. Sure, okay. we are. What, what's to say that it's not just a threshold thing? The number of, number of no, number of neural connections reach a threshold. I don't know if you've ever read any Heinlein. No, no, I know what you mean. Yeah, but the well, once again, why would we be the only ones with the threshold? See, when you talk about uh, evolution, I used to be an evolutionist, uh, be it through uh, Dar Darwinian gradualism or through punctuated equilibrium, which is, you know, advancing in leaps and bounds through mutation. Right. Right. Either way, you've got to be able to show some kind of a common thread, some kind of a path to where you got to. All right. There isn't one. Okay. So you could say, hypothetically, what about this? But then you're arguing from lack of information. You're saying, well, I don't have any proof of this, but... What if? Well, sorry, not good enough. I want to know wh where it came from. And then, well, I, it doesn't work well with a lot of beliefs. It doesn't work well with, you know, any kind of an earthy belief where you worship Gaia and we all come from, you know, Mother Earth and so forth. It doesn't work well with uh, Eastern myth mysticism. It doesn't work well with a lot of things, you know, with, with the force, <laughs> you know, Zen Buddhism, because we all come, we are all supposed to have that commonality. And this instead sets us apart. Right. Then you read Genesis 1. Let's read Genesis 1 when we come back. Welcome back to Grassroots Radio Colorado. This is Chris Cook. I've got Corey and Andy Pate of the Party of Choice, thepartyofchoice.com. Go check them out. Um, and we're, we're talking about 
Christians and non-Christian conservatives being together in the party. And, and so first, our, our, our first order of business is to establish that the Christians in the party are not kooks. We don't, we don't believe this because we've just come to it through faith. There are some intellectual underpinnings here that, that a, a reasonable human being can go through and, and yeah. come to, come to our, uh, come to our faith. And I could spend hours hold on, hold on. There you go. Try it again. <laughs> okay. And I could spend hours on, you know, the, the, the fossil record and all that kind of stuff and bore the tear, bore people to tears. The, let, let's take a look at where progressive creativity, where did it come from? Because you got to show some kind of a path to it. Otherwise you're arguing from lack of evidence. Well, maybe it just happened with this. Well, you can say that, but I'm, I'm trying to show where something else is more likely. Okay. All right. Um, in Genesis 1, we see for the first 25 verses, we see um, God creating. And we see him creating this, and it was good, creating that, and it was good. This is good. That's good. And he keeps creating. And here's the thing. He's not adapting to his surroundings to survive. He's doing it for pleasure. Right. He doesn't need these surroundings to survive. And he's doing it progressively, making more, more, and adding to it, adding to it, adding to it, simply for his pleasure. Then in verse, and that includes the animals, and they're included in that list. But then in verse 26, he, there's a pause and he changes completely. And he says, let us make man in our image. You know, and in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. The, we were made in his image. We were made to be like him. Now, that's going to take on more importance at the end of the show when I talk about Christmas. Okay. So I'll come back to that. But first of all, I just want to give an example of where the Bible shows a, an origin. It shows why he did it. He made all of this, and then he made us to be different with it. Um, you know, the, the, the liberals in Boulder have one thing right. Man is not symbiotic with nature. Okay. Okay. They look at us as a wrecking ball. <laughs> you know, and it's true. We can do great things or terrible things. Right. We can, and that's because you could plop us out of nature and nature would function pretty much just fine. We are different. We, we stand apart. Right. We progress. We use nature not symbiotically at all. And the thing that keeps us apart, the main thing, one of several, is progressive creativity. So that's one example of a difference, just something that you see in nature that's not explained well in other theories that is explained in Christianity. Okay. Makes sense? Okay. Uh, another one would be the sun and moon. This is a quickie. Because, uh, <clears throat> like I said, I could do a lot of different ones, but a lot of them take a while, so I'm just doing quickies. Genesis one sixteen talks about, you know, and God created the greater light to, to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. And, of course, those are the sun and moon. Well, so what, right? We, we know there's a sun and then the moon is a reflective surface that's closer to the earth. But here's the, here's the question. What are the odds? What are the odds that man would evolve from the muck on this one planet with its one sun to go with its one moon and that the two of them would be so precisely measured in mass and distance from the earth that they would appear the same size from our planet's surface? I I don't think I've ever bought the odds theory. It's <laughs> I, I I really I I really that that one for me intellectually that's not that that type of reasoning is not what brought me to my faith. That's fine. So actually, uh, I came to my faith more through well other things that would take too long. Okay, but you see what I'm saying is this: the odds against that are incredible. All right, they are absolutely incredible. Um, if, when the moon passes in front of the sun, we can actually study the corona. The odds of them being the, appearing the same that, that 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 takes really precise measurement. So it's really incredible, and it just seems very odd. Okay, okay. that doesn't that's not proof of God. That's proof of weird. Okay, all right, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, and 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 certainly proof of uh, pretty pretty um, dif, dif, distant odds. Okay, here's the last one: motives. And I want to talk about animals again. Um, I think I might have mentioned this with Tom. Let's say that uh, you have a college roommate, okay, and you and that you and that roommate, um, you get a dog, all right, because you want to have a dog around the around the room, around the apartment, and you get these wonderful doggy treats, not the rotten vegetarian ones. You get the real ones because you actually like the dog and don't want to <laughs> convert it into vegetarianism, and so you get a really good doggy treats, and the dog's name could be I don't know, name a dog name. 
Butch. Butch. Okay, Butch. Butch loves these doggy treats. They're great. Now, you give the doggy treats to Bush because you because you like Butch. You like seeing him be be happy. Right. You know, he does a trick or whatever, and you give him a treat. Well, your your roommate, we'll say it's Becky. Becky's got issues. Okay. Becky has very low self esteem. Becky wants Bush to Butch to really like Becky. Okay? So Becky gives Butch a lot of fruit and treats. Okay. She does it just so she can get the, the self esteem. So she can feel valued. All right. In fact, she wants Butch to like her more than you. So she makes sure that she gives Butch more of the more of the uh, doggy treats. Here's the question. Oh, oh, well, really quickly here. Your motives are are unselfish. Right. Hers are selfish. Okay. Here's the question: Does Butch care? Which of us is? Does he care about what the our motives? motives? Are no. No, and this is a really interesting thing. People value unselfishness above all human characteristics. It's true. It's the most. Let's say you're trying to emerge into traffic and it's heavy traffic, and somebody you know let you know, waves you in and they back up a little and let you in. That immediately says something to you. They're pushing themselves back a moment for your for your sake. It's small. Okay. When we think of great things done by people, it's always the unselfish things done on the behalf of others. We look at their motives. If a guy and a girl are dating and he treats her just wonderfully, 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 but then she finds out he was doing it for the wrong motives, everything he did, she doesn't care. Right. She hates him. Right. And vice versa. It can go the other way. The... Um, you know, some people will say, well, love is the most important thing. Yeah, but we only care about it if it's unconditional love, you know, unselfish love. We don't want selfish love. We don't want somebody who uses us. Okay. You know, for what they can get. It needs to be for us. The desire for the, the valuing unselfishness is a very human thing, and it sets us apart. Animals, there's no proof, at least. No evidence of this anywhere in the animal kingdom. They act in response to what they get or what can be done for them or for their herd or for their species. You know, instinct and so forth. Motives mean everything to us. Now, once again, I, I look and try to see uh, where does that come from. And in Genesis 1, I see, I see a good reason again. All right. Here we have God, a spiritual God creating a physical universe, which is pretty interesting because he has no need for one. Right. Right. If a spiritual God has no use for a physical universe, which means he's making it for someone else. Us. A pure act of unselfishness. OK. Which, by the way, he did again when he came on the cross. All right. Unselfishness. Unselfishness. And we value that. Even having fallen, we value getting back to it even more. OK. Does that make sense? I'm just showing where these things come from, where they're not well explained. Right. Um, a lot of the um, earthy type religions rely very heavily on mankind has to fit in nature somehow. And what I'm showing is he doesn't. She doesn't. And we don't. And so that those things are very good evidences of we're different. And then when you see them explained immediately in the first chapter of the Bible, well, that's pretty powerful. Right. Now, that's not proof that Jesus Christ is the way. I would have to go into other things for that. And I don't want to do that tonight. Tonight, I just want to talk about how Christianity is reasonable. Okay. Not kooky. Right. Well, and, and for my own faith, and I don't talk about my faith a lot on this program. This isn't, it's not in general a religious program, but uh, I am a Christian. And I became a Christian after I read the case for Christ. When I when I saw the the evidence, when I saw it laid out, that was how I I was able to to to, to make that that leap. I guess and great book. Yeah, it really is. It really Lee Strobel. I mean, that was amazing, life changing book. And having having the evidence laid out in front of me, and a, Mr. Strobel himself was an atheist when he started this investigation and became a Christian as the result of the research that he did for that book. That that was what convinced me, and I think probably a lot of other people as well. That kind of intellectual pursuit to to look at you know what what is the objective case for this? Mm -hmm. Not not all of us just had a and you're healed moment you know and <laughs> and you know or some sort of tent revival kind of thing um, that that a lot of us have come to our faith very reasonably from a, a very intellectual place 
And I think that's that's the main point of, of what we're trying to get to right now, right? Right. This this stuff first just shook my belief in not believing in God. Right. Because for that to be true, we didn't we had to not fit. I mean, we had to fit in nature, and I mean really fit. And we don't. We don't. We don't fit well. We are not symbiotic. We don't fit very well at all in a lot of ways. And I only mentioned a couple. There are so many more. Right. Then, but that's. But you'll notice I'm not getting into all the proofs of Christ and His resurrection and this kind of stuff. It's not that kind of show. I just want to talk about us being reasonable. And the next section, I want to talk about how cool non-Christian conservatives are because okay. they really are. <laughs> that sta- almost sounds like an overstatement here. I mean, I just, I mean, it just it isn't. I, I want help, help me help me convince the the audience that this is not going to be an overstatement. That this is, I mean, you are you are sincere in that in that statement. I have several friends who are atheist conservatives, and they are spectacular. And I want to talk about what sets them apart from liberal, from atheist liberals. Okay. They are very different, and they're and 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 I love them dearly. Okay. And by the way, we can work together and should. There's no reason we can't. I, that I definitely agree with. I have a bunch of friends who are objectivists. Um, that's that's a lot of the way I came to my con, a lot of my conservative beliefs was talking to objectivists and Ayn Rand and and all of that. And of course, I, almost to a T, almost all of them are are atheists. And. Uh, Yet still, we are all running in the right direction, in mm-hmm. the same direction. So when we come back, we'll, we'll talk about non-Christian conservatives yep. and how they fit into the party and how they fit into the party and how they fit into the party.